Welcome to the next episode of Your Charisma Coach. It is finally here. Joining me today is master hypnotist. In fact, I'm going to be honest, the world's greatest hypnotist Whew. is here with me today. And uh, Igor Lederhoski. Hello, everyone. Back by popular demand. Well, thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks for being here. So today, Igor's kindly uh, going to share some of his insights in being able to read people as you're talking to them, because it's always good to know or get an idea I think, whether when you're having a conversation with somebody, is it going well? Is it going bad? And it's good to be able to pick up the clues from Absolutely. the facial cues, if you are. And, and actually, is, is the crucial thing. It's not just facial cues, by the way. It's the whole body language is important. And I mean, the key really is, like anything, if you're just talking at someone, then you have no idea what, what's going on. You may as well just be reading a script. You know, in hypnosis, a lot of people just read scripts and ignore the person. Uh, and those are awful conversations. You probably had them yourself when someone talks at you and talks at you and talks at you. And inside, you find yourself you know, trying to do a, dig a little hole in your own mind and creep into it because the conversation has no fun, no spark, no right. energy. And to avoid being that guy or that girl, really, you have to pay attention to the other person. And if you hit something that is either unpleasant or dull for the person, then you have to be able to read their body language and find out, well, am I on the right path or am I not on the right path, right? Right now, Marcus, for example, is giving us some wonderful signals of interest. He's actually liking it. Oh, my goodness. Uh, how can you tell? Well, he's making a lot of eye contact, which is usually a, a good sign. No, not everyone will make eye contact. Some people are very shy, so they'll look away. But they'll look away so they can listen. They'll tend to turn their ear towards you. Uh, other thing that he's doing is he's kind of like nodding away to himself. Sometimes his eyes sort of drift off and he's nodding away, which tells me he's thinking about the idea and he's going to know, yeah, I've, I've, I've had an experience like that. That's the kind of experience that's going on inside right now, right? right. Now, of course, I made you very self-conscious about this whole thing. <laughs> and, and the of course, wrong. Exactly. And, and that's one of the, 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 the downsides. Once you know this initially, you'll get a little self-conscious because you know you'll catch yourself doing it. That, that passes. Don't pay much, too much attention to that. It's just, you know, we're making something unconscious conscious, mm. which creates a little bit of awkwardness. But then we let it back to unconsciousness again then it becomes smooth and natural and easy, right? right? So we're going to go almost through a process when we're looking for things like this where it's going to feel a little bit second nature to begin with. Yeah, well, yeah, it's, going to, it, it's actually second nature to start with. Then it's going to become awkward because you're looking for it specifically. And you're going like, ooh, did I just twitch? What's, what's going on here? Or did I just look at him too much? I don't know, right? Right. Um, but once you get through that phase because you're overanalyzing essentially, uh, I call this the law of reverse effect. When the conscious mind tries to do something that the unconscious mind was designed to do, it kind of gets in the way. Mm. Think of it like a five-year-old trying to play football with dad, and dad's about to score a goal, and the five-year-old wants to help and kick the ball for him. He's just going to get in the way, which is fine for the fun of the game, but not so good if you want to actually score the goal, right? So the conscious mind is a bit like that five-year-old who's going to get in the way all the time. The, the, the best way you work together is when the five-year-old says, Daddy, score a goal. And then the unconscious mind goes, all right, son, here we go, and boots the ball nice and neatly into the goal. That's what we're going to get to when we get these skills. So you'll go through a little hump where you get self-conscious, just let it go, and suddenly you'll enjoy the conversation so much more. Fantastic. So I know when I'm talking to people, I'm usually very good subconsciously of picking up what they're, how they're reacting and right. what I'm feeling. I usually right. have my gut instinct there. That's an excellent way of doing it. You see, that's why we have these things called gut instinct. I don't even know this, but your hollow organs, which are your lungs, your heart, and your intestines, have a whole bunch of nerve fibers around them that some people call a secondary brain. And they process information a little differently, and they send it up your, through your spinal column, through a little um, a piece of your spinal column called lamina one. And that lamina one goes through all three parts of your brain, the, the so-called reptilian brain, mammalian brain, and the neocortex, the, the human sort of brain, um, which means that you have access to a lot of information from these gut instincts. The thing you need to want to learn, of course, is to attune your gut instinct to what you're seeing so you kind of know what it means a little bit, right? right. So it helps to have some idea of what you're looking for, but ultimately, the place you really notice is you're just kind of generally sensing what the body is doing. But then when you feel it, then you'll know. I can I give you a quick example of this? I think I may have used this example the last time we spoke. But I, I used to have this when my, my parents used to run dinner parties, you know, they, they with kids. Right. And I'd go around handing trays of little bits mm. and pieces out and say, oh, sir, smoked salmon for you. That's very nice. Thank you. Um, and what I found, which was very odd for me at the time, was with some people, I'd feel very relaxed and be open. I'd be very chatty. With other people, I'd be really tense and really nervous, and I just couldn't think of what to say. And I couldn't understand for ages why that was. 
but knowing, looking back on it now as a hypnotist, I realized it's that gut instinct you were talking about. It's that lamina one giving me information. When they were uncomfortable, I was picking up on it unconsciously. That made me feel uncomfortable. That's basically my unconscious mind saying, this is the emotion the other person's having. And that shut me down. And of course, the opposite is the, 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 the same as well. And of course, one of the things that you do, and I, you do really elegantly, is, and I've seen you do this a lot of times, is you can ride the wave of that discomfort mm. to get them back to being comfortable again, which is really one of the big secrets behind the whole charisma and rapport thing, right? Absolutely. I think the more happy you are, the more at peace you are with discomfort, the greater power you have in the conversation. And it sounds like such a paradox, doesn't it? It does. Being at peace with discomfort, being happy with discomfort, actually knowing that it's actually not you, it's not your fault. It's the poor other person that's suffering and you then have tools to help them stop suffering in this sort of social arena, right? Right. A really good tool I found is just to be aware of your breath. If you do feel discomfort... Wonderful. Enjoy your oxygen. And that usually carry you through to a much more constructive place. Actually, that's actually a very good point. This is, there's actually research behind this, believe it or not. Yeah. Um, the idea of uh, being aware of your breathing is, is a kind of a mindfulness meditation where you just breathe in and out. And this is one of the most researched phenomena in meditation, this type of mindfulness breathing. And what apparently happens, one of the things that happens as a result of this, um, in your prefrontal cortex, which is basically the area here in the front of your forehead, if I could press behind my skull, this whole area here is called the prefrontal cortex. And that's where your personality is, uh, all the things that make you a responsible, sane adult kind of operate over here. And there's a string of fibers called GABA fibers, gamma amino butyric acid, because I know you're interested. <laughs> Where have you? Where have you? I'm if you're going to mention that or not. <laughs> right. You, you see the slight tension that I developed, the glazing of the eyes? That's a disinterest signal. <laughs> Hence a little humor to liven things up. Um, but these GABA fibers are interesting because they hook up to a part of your a mammalian brain called the amygdala. The amygdala is responsible for basically pushing the panic button. When you feel afraid, the amygdala is kind of overactive. What these GABA fibers do is they send signals out to turn the panic button off. The more you use it, the stronger that signal is. So basically, you're developing a light switch to turn off fear, to turn off discomfort, to turn off anger or any other sort of strong emotion, right? So this idea of being aware of your breathing actually ends, especially in an unpleasant situation, you don't build the negativity, you're letting it sort of dissipate, and you're teaching your brain to literally grow a muscle that throws a light switch on fear, which I think is really cool. Absolutely. Now, just to wrap up, I, I wondered if we had, uh, I could ask you, are there any tried and tested or very sure clues that uh, somebody will give with their body language if we know they're sure. being receptive? Because some people can be like poker players. You can't really tell sure. how the communication's going. Actually, uh, you asked me two different questions there. Let me answer the second one uh, first because that's actually the more interesting one, right? When you're dealing with a poker player, you typically have someone who has learned to hide their reaction, typically because they've had a unpleasant experiences when they were younger, childhood and so on, where they got punished for their true reaction. So they learn to hide it, right? They're wearing a mask, so to speak. So when they're all correct and they're saying, basically, I'm dead from the neck down, I have no emotions, it's not that they have no emotions, it's that they've learned to hide them very well, sometimes even for themselves. Now, if you want to know how you're doing with people like that, you need to basically trip them up a little bit. You need to get them uh, a little more animated so you actually see what their real feelings are, their real responses. Okay, so now that we've got this general idea that we need to trip them up a little bit to get a genuine unconscious response, what kind of things can we do? Basically, anything unexpected will get a more genuine unconscious response. In fact, the more engaged they are, the more they expect one type of thing, and suddenly something totally different happens, the more dramatic the response tends to be, right? So, for example, if I, uh, if you, I was getting kind of a poker face from out of, out of you, and because we're friends a little bit, I can actually... Uh, do a little more than I might do with a complete stranger, but I might start touching you physically, shaking your heart a little bit and say, so tell me, what do, you, what do you really mean? And notice what's going on here. Do you see how his face is lighting up more and more, right? What happened there before he's just there politely listening, when I touched him, this is actually creating a little bit of a kind of a threat signal. It, it, because we're friendly, it doesn't translate as that, but you're very aware of that hand, right? Sure. Now I start shaking you a little bit. Now you see it's happening again. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's wonderful. What's happening is I'm amplifying his internal experience just by doing something unusual mm. and that takes what's already inside and makes more of it. So in this case, again, see so he's trying to resist, but he knows what I'm doing now. And 
of course, if he gets too used to this hand over here, I might be over here, I might touch his hand a little bit and go, hey, well, yeah, <laughs> then we start slapping around and so on. But really, what's going on is I'm giving you something else to focus on. Or I might say, have a look over there. And when you talk about, you know, we were talking about before, suddenly we have a more honest, unconscious response there. Now, of course, there are millions of techniques that you could do to distract their attention so that when they refocus on what you're talking about, you get a split second where the mask slips and you actually mm. see what's going on. And then, of course, the mask returns again very nicely like that. And <laughs> there it is again. So that's a really simple way of getting their genuine reaction. Uh, another way you can do it is, and this is one of my favorite ways of doing this, is I call this goading, right? Basically, it's teasing, but with a... In it with a friendly air. It's not like, oh, you're ugly, haha, <laughs> right? It's teasing them in a friendly way. Like, let's say I, I don't know whether or not he's interested in this conversation right now, right? I might turn to, to him and say, all right, I'm not getting much of a reaction. He's saying, this is boring, isn't it? This is really dull. No, not at all. This is the dullest thing you've ever heard. It is. Is it? Okay. I don't know, is it? No, of course not. So there you go. Do you see what just happened there? You probably saw his, his brow furrowing down a little bit. His eyes got a little more intense, got a little crinkle there, got a smile. There was a little emotional spike. He was trying to reassure me, of course. But why? Because I'm teasing him a little bit about how dull this thing might be. Um, but really, it just forces him to amplify his emotion to show what's going on. Of course, that's a direct tease. If we actually had a content for the conversation, it'd be easier to find a more, a more natural tease or a goad. But that's a really useful way, especially if you go you know, the opposite way to where they want to go. I mean, a, a classic one, if I may share the story. There's a great therapist called Frank Farelli who created a whole system of therapy called provocative therapy. Now, before I describe this, please note, this is not advice on how to do therapy because it is very provocative and requires a little bit of a fine feeling to know when and where you do this. But here's the kind of thing he would do. Uh, someone might come in and they sit down and go, I'm depressed. I think I'm going to kill myself. And the traditional therapist might go, well, tell me about your childhood, young man, right? Mm, whatever. What he would do instead is go, all right, go ahead. And the person would go, what? Aren't you supposed to be talking me out of it? He goes, I don't feel like it today. What? Huh? Of course, it's important to realize that when he's doing this, he's doing it with a little twinkle in his eye and a friendly background. So he's not being disrespectful of the person. He's just doing something so off the wall, they don't quite know what to make of it. Now, whilst they're in confusion, look at him going, What? That drops the mask for a little while, and the real things start coming out. Because goes, aren't you supposed to talk me out of it? No, I don't feel like it today. But wh why not? Well, why not could you kill yourself anyway? Suddenly, they tell them the real thing that's going on, things that they actually sometimes hid from themselves. So really, it's by getting them so surprised by a situation that they have no pre-planned way of hiding their emotion. That's really the essence of the goading, the distracting, all the other stuff we talked about, is surprise that the conscious mind has no way of knowing what to do with it, which means the mask falls away because all that's left is pure unconscious moment. And that's when you get a much more genuine and readable reaction. Right, right. I think it's fair to say you're probably one of the most dangerous men on the planet. So, uh, <laughs> now, I'm incredibly self-conscious, which is not good for a charisma coach. Uh, I want to thank you so much for sharing the absolute gold that you've got in there. The, the other plan I had of getting it out was with a hammer and chisel, so this is much... Well, much I, I prefer this one too. Thank you. Good, good. <laughs> um, if you'd like to find out more about Igor and his amazing training, you can find out by going to uh, hypnosistrainingacademy.com. That's exactly right. So please check it out. Igor, thanks so much. Thank you very much. See you on the next episode. Goodbye. Today we're going to look at how to handle that situation when you start a conversation with somebody and you say something dumb. Because that doubt is what keeps a lot of us from starting conversations in the first place. For example, when you make a social faux pas. Because usually what happens is we're not prepared for situations like that and a conversation descends into the dreaded silence. So today I'm going to show you...